Father, thank you for your word. Your word gives us life. Your word gives us truth. Your word gives us strength. Your word gives us hope. Your word gives us lessons. God, may all the lessons of your word come to pass in our lives that we learn and we be changed. And if there's anybody here, God, that does not know you, anybody here that has never experienced the touch of your word, may you, by the power of your word, by the strength of your Holy Spirit, begin to shine light in the darkest places of our hearts. These things we ask in your name, above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If there was ever a chapter in the scripture that would be called pregnant, this is it. This chapter has got so much in it that you can just dive into the depths of the ocean and just sink in. Small chapter, 20 verses or so, 21 verses. I could easily gloss through it and get on to chapter 4. But in the last two weeks of praying this chapter through and reading it, I really sensed that the Spirit wanted to do something in my life through this chapter. And I hope and I pray that the things that we talk about tonight offend you enough to make, to make a mindset change that will lead to a, a literal change of life. Verse 1, chapter 3, the book of Samuel. <clears throat> now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Please give me your attention. As always, brief overview. Child Samuel had a mother named Hannah, had a father named Elkanah, and Hannah was barren for how, who knows how long, 10 years. She prayed, and she made a promise to God. She said, God, if you get me pregnant, if you open my womb, I will give you this child, and all the days of his life he will serve you. Well, lo and behold, she gets pregnant. And she does something incredible. She actually follows through with a promise that she made to God. And somewhere between the ages of three and five, she brings her child to the temple, which is in Shiloh. They had the tabernacle set up. There was no temple yet built, but it was a, a tabernacle. And she says, Eli, this is the child I promised. Let him stay with you. Now, some say it was two or three times a year she'd come and she'd bring him clothes and she'd see him. But all the days of his life, dedicated to the Lord. Now, here we are. The kid, they say, is about 12 years old. And the boy was ministering to the Lord before Eli. That word for minister literally means serving. So he was helping Eli. Eli, some say, was in his 90s at this point in time. He was old. He was extremely heavy. Couldn't see real good. And he did all the things, but he did not yet understand the way the Spirit moved upon the hearts of men. And so true is this for so many. They come to the Lord and they look at other Christians and they say, that's how I'm supposed to act, thinking that's how they're supposed to act. Not realizing God doesn't want to do something in your life like he did in my life. He wants to do something in your life with your life, right where you're at. He doesn't want you to act like me. And everybody said, thank God. <laughs> He wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, so that you are you, the best you, the filled with the Spirit in the most, and do crazy things in your life and with your life. You guys have heard me say, and if you're new to our church, I say it all the time, being a pastor is not the pinnacle of success in Christianity. The pinnacle of success in Christianity is doing exactly what you've been called to do. And you have no idea how many people I know who are pastors that should not be. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Meaning... If you guys were with us for the last few months, we've been going through the book of Judges, and we saw it was a black time in the nation of Israel, dark times. The people of Israel were wicked and foul, and they didn't understand God. They thought God was something superstitious, not unlike the direction our very country today is heading. 
The Word of God, what's that? That's something you recite at a funeral or a wedding or something like that. The Word of God was rare, meaning God wasn't using, there weren't many prophets in the land. Matter of fact, funny that Samuel turns out to be the last judge and the first prophet in the nation of Israel. However, continuing, verse 2, And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, while Samuel was lying down, Please stop. Give me your attention. Let me explain to you. It said, he went in his little room to lie down. He was apparently had his own little room. He went and he lies down. Samuel was about to go to sleep. His eyes were growing dim. The, the lights, every day it was the job of the priest to trim, to keep the tabernacle lit. They had the menorah. You guys remember what a menorah looks like? Some of you guys, we went, when we were going through the book of Exodus, we looked at how they built the menorah. Their job was to keep it lit. Now, at night, the lights went out, and in the day, I'm sorry, in the day, the light would go out. The night would get, get ready. Before the night was out, they'd have to trim it and set the wax and the oil that lighted all over so that all night long the light would be burning bright. You understand? He says, before the light had even gone out, the Lord called Samuel, verse 4, and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose, went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Please give me your attention again. So true of so many people. The Bible says that many are called, few are chosen. Some of you have been called by the Lord. You hear a voice, you hear a calling, you hear something in your heart. And you're running to all the wrong places. I'm not even going to say you guys, because you guys are at least in the right place. You're, in, you're at least in a church on a Wednesday night. But maybe there might be some here who are here because they were dragged by a friend, by threatened by a relative. In all your life, you knew there was a call on your life. I remember myself, a young lad, I knew God would call me, not unlike Samuel. I just, I knew it. I knew, I knew the Lord Jesus wanted me, but I was going to all the wrong places. Oh, I wanted to be a gangster. Oh, I wanted to be rich. Oh, I wanted to have this. Oh, I wanted to have that. But I knew somewhere buried inside my heart, it was God. I knew it, and I kept it quiet. And I'd run and to this guy, to that person, to that person, to that. I didn't call you, man. And so many of us, we find out where we're at. We don't really belong. I remember hanging out with my friends. There it was in Ozone Park, Queens. They were all hanging out, drinking and partying and have a good time. Now, I don't know if you guys know what having a good time is New York style. But it's something like this. There's about two, e two feet of snow on the ground and then about four inches of ice over it. You're standing around in the schoolyard. It's closed because it's the middle of the night. You have a beer in your hand. You shared your gloves with your friends. He's got one, you got the other one. And you're sitting there shivering, trying as fast as you can to warm up by getting drunk. But it's somehow, it's just making you colder. And you're shivering in your head. Having a good time? Man, this is great, isn't it? <laughs> and the radio, it's so cold and your batteries are dying. And, and you're listening to some terrible 60s music and it everything starts to sound like Jim Morrison because it's moving very slow and 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 you're sitting there having a good time telling each other how much fun it is lying about stories you never really did and women you never really <laughs> having fun I'm having a ball me too and I knew I didn't belong there I knew it and let me tell you, <laughs> I knew I didn't belong there for about 15 years. <laughs> 
And I remember being 13, 14 years old and hanging out with the Zones of 63. The 63 was the schoolyard. It was in New York is PS 125. The school we hung out was PS 63. And the guys that hung out, they were called the Zones because they were always zoned out. Zoned out was like, they're always getting high. And I was hanging out with the Zones of City. I remember me and my buddy Patty, and we were, I was, he was 14, I was 13. We were, we were, hanging, we're, we're Zones now, aren't we, Patty? No, we ain't Zones. When are we going to be Zones? I don't know, but we're not Zones. How do you know we're not Zones? Because we keep coming here without anybody calling us. Oh, we're just, we were having a good time. And, and I remember looking at these older guys, and some of them were in their late 20s, and thinking, these guys are so cool. These guys are cool, man. And, 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 and people in my life would just tell me how, when you hang out, those guys are losers, man. They're losers. Do you understand? They're in their 20s. They don't have a job. They, they don't even have a car. I mean, goodness sakes, they're losers. No, man. I just remember thinking they were so cool. From looking at the older guys and thinking they were so cool. Somewhere down the line, I became that older guy that the other kids were looking at, and I was so cool. Didn't have no job, didn't have no car, didn't have no girlfriend, <laughs> but I was so cool to the 13 and 14 year olds. And I knew I didn't belong. And I knew it was the voice of the Lord, Ryan, Ryan. But there was nobody there to tell me, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. That, that restlessness, that restlessness in your spirit, it's the Lord. I grew up, there was no such thing as a, a Christian church like this. I went to a Catholic church when funerals or weddings or once in a while Christmases. And I just, when I walked in there, man, there was this reverence. This, and I knew I belonged in there. But I couldn't deal with the whole priest thing. It was just, it just man, I just, it's just so uncomfortable. My whole life was just, man, I was either hot or I was cold. And... Does anybody know what I'm talking about or am I just whacked? Man. I moved down to Florida. I'm 22 years old. Still really cool if you were like 14. <laughs> and it wasn't. Two years, a year and a half into it, somebody said, hey, you got to come to this church, man. I went, and this guy, this little skinny guy preaching, and I was like, what is this, man? This is church. This is church? Where's, like, the priest, man? Where's the big crucifix with Jesus on the cross, man? No, it ain't like that. This is born again. Born again? Am I becoming a born again? I ain't no born again. Remember New York being born again. I didn't know it was, but I didn't want to be it. But I walked in that place, and the second I walked in that place, I heard the voice, Ryan! It was like, it was scary to me because I heard it that loud when I was a kid. Ryan! I love you! And then as I went through the trials of my life, that voice grew so dim, I didn't even know if I heard it anymore. I thought I heard it. Maybe I heard it. Maybe I didn't. I walked into that church. And the hush of God was there. And the people of God were there. And that music started playing. It just absolutely melted my heart. Oh, I hit it. I was dating my wife at the time. We were just boyfriend and girlfriend. And we go on Sundays, 6, 7 o'clock. We get there like three quarters of the way through the service. We'd walk in. I just heard his voice again so clear. It's like, yes, he did call me wanted somebody to tell me how to hear the voice of the Lord. Now listen, stepping now, accepting Christ, being born again, young believers are still struggling how to hear the voice of the Lord. Listen to me. You can have the calling of God on your life. You may even, might even have even answered the call of, you, of your life and say, I believe Make me a Christian. But there is a deeper hearing of God's voice, an understanding that ministry calls you, an understanding that God is supernatural. It's like, I've been using this as an example because it's, it's where I am in my life. Um, <clears throat> If you look at any of the religious stuff online, if you go to the, the Way of the Master or any of the Christian stuff on YouTube and see all the comments afterward, 
and the hate-filled stuff, and you're just like, dude, you have, you're missing it. it, it listen, it's, it's hard enough to explain prayer to a Christian. Most Christians don't even understand prayer. Most Christians don't even understand the whole Word of God thing, the application thereof in somebody's life, let alone people who don't know the Lord, let alone people who've never been to church, and, and they just, they're getting it all wrong. It's like, dude, dude, no, no, no. They've got, they're missing the whole point. And it breaks your heart and angers and frustrates you. Dude, you... I had one guy was commenting uh, about a Christian fighter. There was this MMA fighter who was praying before, and it said afterward, I guess his opponent didn't pray as hard as him. Like, no, you missed it. That's not what that means, man. Oh, oh, what about turn the other cheek? Dude, and you're just like, you want to look him up? Let me give the guy a call or something. It's so pervasive, even in the church. Listen, how many of you guys want to know what God's plan for your life is? How many of you want to hear the voice of the Lord? Not that many, huh? Wow. Okay, I'm just making sure. That wasn't rhetorical, all right? Participate a little bit. Let me get a little something back from you, okay? You feel me, Junior? Okay. <laughs> he hesitated. He was like, okay. Um... So Samuel arose, verse 6 again, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. He said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. Please give me your attention. Here's the application of this. If you want to hear the voice of the Lord, there's 800,000 words in this book. And God wants you to hear every single one of them. Some of them are just instruction for life. But some of them, every once in a while, on any given day, or what's called a rhema word, R-H-E-M-A, a word that God speaks like it's to your heart, like it's a prophecy for you, like it's something... I know God spoke to me, okay? I know it. And that is a promise that you stand upon. That is something you hold on to. Now, when you have first done that, when you've lied down and said, speak for your servant is listening, and God sends you a word, and you're not sure it's the word of the Lord, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, then you go and counsel with a pastor, with an elder, with a sister or brother in the Lord. And you say, hey, I think God spoke to me. Really? Tell me how. Well, the first thing you have to say is, I was reading scripture and great start. That's the way it always starts. And it says here that God doesn't want anybody to be alone. So that guy I met at 7-Eleven, he's the one God has for me. <laughs> Does he go to church? I don't know. I just saw him, but he was really good looking. <laughs> and your pastor, your friend, your brother or sister might say, I don't think that was the Lord. That wasn't the Lord either. <laughs> that was his phone. I remember some of the ways that the Lord spoke to me in Rama word fashion, positive and negative in my life, was in 1997, when I got out of prison, a friend of mine said, let's open up a store together. And now I was a new believer. I had gotten saved about a year before I went to prison. And in prison, I was studying. And the Lord said, do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer. 
my pastor was doing a, a teaching at church and he spoke so clearly, he said, don't be unequally yoked with a non-believer for what does light have to do with darkness? And something about it just bang, it punched me right in the heart. I was like, what was that? Now I was like Samuel, I didn't know it was the Lord. I had no idea that the Lord was speaking to me. But over the course of the next few days, I had heard that verse two or three more times. And I thought, I remember saying to my wife, huh, that's weird. I heard that verse just a couple of days ago. Now, as a new believer, you don't understand. It's almost like a faith thing. You don't even think God can speak to you like that. You don't even realize he does. That's what's called a confirming word. Well, me, the obedient servant that I am, I opened up a store with him anyway. It was a miserable failure, and he wound up losing a lot of money, and I lost a lot of time because it was in Miami. I lost a lot of money, too, but I didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> Brings back bad memories. I remember when I was in prison, I was reading my morning devotion. I had a devotion book that every day I was determined I would not miss. One day, every single day while I was away, I was going to read the Bible. Because that's what Christians do. And I remember reading, going through, um, I think it was... Luke, where he says, I have anointed you to preach to the poor, to set the captives free, to loose the bonds. He goes through this list of things. And I thought, man, there's that feeling. I didn't know what it was, but something stuck out. It, it almost like stuck in my craw. How many of you guys take vitamins? You ever eat too many at once and one gets stuck in your throat? <laughs> You're like, oh, crap. And then it starts to melt in your throat, and you're like, yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> Drinking water, and it's, it's, like, it's like stuck, though. It's like... <laughs> that's what happens when you read the Word and God speaks to you. It's like that. And then two days later, my pastor, John Cinelli, he comes up to see me and he says to me, Ryan, I have a word for you from the Lord. I was like, what's that? He goes, well, I was praying for you. And in my morning devotion, I believe God gave me a word to give to you. He said, it's from Isaiah. It says here, I have anointed you to preach the poor, to set the captives free. I was like, that's so cool. I just read that in Luke. Yes, the writer from Luke was quoting from Isaiah. And I thought, that's really cool. <laughs> I didn't know that the Lord was speaking to me. I didn't know he was prophesying over me, the Lord was, of something I was going to do in the future. It's like, wow. Wow. So if you want to hear the voice of the Lord, it's not where you are. You don't climb to the highest mountain. You don't go to a tree. You don't, you don't have to put your hands in a certain way. You don't have to come to church five times a week. You don't have to. It's reading the word. Now, when you've been obedient to reading the word and been obedient to the things that the word says, God will start to speak to you so clearly in your heart That sometimes you're driving, and he'll tell you to go left instead of right. But God, my house is that way. I want you to make a left. And it's the weirdest feeling. He's like, God, oh, that can't be God. And you make a right anyway. Sometimes God just has you do stuff just because. And I could tell you story after story, but there's so much more to do of th times that I just sense the spirit of the living God tell me, Ryan, pray for that woman. And I'm like, God, I'm at the bank, and it's like really embarrassing to pray for people in line at the bank. I'm like, look at me. I'm in work mode. I'm like, not in the mood. <laughs> Let's do that whole Jesus thing when I'm at church, God. Pray for that girl. I don't want to pray for that girl. <laughs> and then I wind up with this tussle in my heart. Pray for her before it's too late. Pray. No, she's going to leave. God, I can't pray for her. It's a woman. I don't minister to women. My wife's not here. And God says, if you don't, I'll get somebody else who will. Okay, 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 I'll do it. 
can I uh, pray for you? What did you say? I know he's going to sound weird, and I'm talking to a plant. <laughs> but I think the Lord wants me to pray for you. Oh, I'm going through such a tough time. My husband left me. We're broke. I'm here trying to get a loan on my own. Father, I just lift up. And then you just pray for her. And everybody in the bank goes, wow, look at the weirdo. They're going to step a few steps back. <laughs> and God says, yeah, yeah, I know how you feel, Ryan. People walked away from me and they said, look at the weirdo hanging on a cross naked. Man up, son. Thank you. And it's funny, the more... And here's the, the crazy part. The more you respond to the Lord saying, pray for that person, the more he employs you to do it. It's, it's not like easy. It doesn't like, okay, I'll pray for this one, but then leave me alone. It doesn't work like that. He just, as hard as it is, as difficult it is, as sometimes as grinding on your personality as it is, as soon as you finish praying for that person and you feel so good and you did something, man, and you, you, you sense that pleasing of the Lord. When you please the Lord is this sense of feeling you get this accomplishment that's greater than anything else. And you walk away and it's not a day later where God says, pray for that person. You go, nope. Not going to do it. Not this. God, listen, we did this last time. It worked out great. Can't we be just happy with that where it is? Like the work is done, right? I finished. I finished. Everybody's been prayed for already. God does the same thing. And we go through this, don't pray, yes pray, don't pray, don't pray, this pray, don't pray. If you don't, I'll get somebody else. Okay, okay, okay! Well, nobody else doing my job. But first, guys, it's the reading of the Word. It's the obedience to Scripture. Do you understand? So what happened when Samuel did it? Verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In the day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Before we read 13, give me your attention. You weren't here last week. We looked at Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two sons, who did wickedness. Although they were supposed to be doing what Samuel was doing, they did as they stole people's money. They slept with the women at, who came for ministry. Imagine a broken, hurting prostitute stripper comes into church and one of the elders of the church who's supposed to be there to minister he winds up hitting on her, taking her out sleeping with her. Is there anything more disgusting? Here's a woman finally finished I'm done, I come to church and she gets taken advantage of. This is what they did. Imagine somebody who's finally at the last, they come to church for help, please help me and you take advantage and you rob their last money Horrible. This was, Eli, this was Hophni, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Now the thing is, the weird thing is, you look at Eli, there was something about Eli that was still godly. There was a remnant of hearing the voice of the Lord because he was obviously doing something right here, but he refused to put his sons in line. Now, I want you to see, we're going to camp out there, and then we're going to come back. We're going to read 13 through, and we're going to see, and we're going we're to talk about that. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for, by sacrificing or offering forever. Now before we go to 15, you guys remember a man of God, a prophet came and told him this just a couple weeks earlier. You guys remember? We looked at it, a man of God who had no name. We didn't even know who the guy was. Apparently prophet came and said, listen, you're running out of chances, dude. You're, this, the priest is going to be ripped from your hands. Your sons are going to die and all this other stuff. And remember, oh, well, you know, if it's God, it's God. It's like you don't know when the last chance you have is. God gives you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. But make no mistake about it. There will be a time where the door is shut. 
craziest, one of the, one of the most dramatic things in the entire Bible is the Ark of Noah. Not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of Noah. It says when he was building it, that he brought Noah, brought, Noah and his family brought all the animals in, and then he took his family in, and then the Bible says that God closed the Ark. That was it. God, the hand of God came and shut that ark and said, that's it. The kingdom is now closed. Could you imagine the screaming, the cries for help? Please let us in. When that, when that rain, can you imagine what that was like before that ship lifted off the ground? Before, can you, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I have this morbid curiosity. But I want to talk to Noah about that when I get to heaven. Like, dude, what was that like? I tried to open the door. I tried. I swear I tried. I'm still haunted by those voices to this day. It's the same way. You will be haunted by the voices of the people in your life who did not know God. I tell this story all the time. It's one of the saddest stories in my life. I had this friend of mine, and he knew I was a Christian. I wasn't a pastor yet. I was just a Christian. I had a business, and he used to come and hang out at my store. He kind of lived his life, and he knew every time we ate, we'd pray together, and we hung out. He was a good friend of mine. He'd come and hang out at the store. Great guy. And one day, he's helping me at my warehouse. Help me clean up some animals, and we ordered some pizza, and I ordered pizza, and he folds up his pizza, and he goes to eat it, and he stops before he puts it in his mouth, and he looks at me. He's waiting for me to pray. I said to him, bro, we don't have to pray every single time we eat. It's okay. It's just food, man. Pray in your heart. Sometimes it's just a matter of praying in your heart. All right, so we go on eating. The day ends. The very next day, I get a phone call. The kid had an epileptic seizure in his sleep and died that night. And I thought to myself, he wanted to pray. I had a chance to pray. Who knows what would have happened? Who knows what did happen? Listen, he came to church. We went to church together a couple times. I don't know if the guy would say that, but I felt like such a failure. He expected me to so pray for the food. The last thing that could have, is I could, instead of sitting here telling you the story, I prayed with him. God shut the door. Boom. And I, you cannot, your life as a Christian is going to have so many of those stories. And you can either harden your heart and say, nah, I'm not interested. They're waiting. And they're crying. And they're screaming. And their cries and their screams, they might not sound like, please help me. But they might sound like, oh, you're so weak. Oh, you're going to church again, Jesus boy? Oh, I forgot you read the Bible now every day. You can't come out and hang out anyway. That's what they're crying. But those are not cries. They're cries for help. And they sit and they watch you. I've said this before. They watch you. They watch you. And they're not waiting for you to fail, like some people think. They're waiting for you to make it. Please, show me it works. Promise me it works. And they watch you. And every time you stumble, just they lose a little bit more. That's why it's so important to be holy, to do the best you can, because the world is watching, and they're not watching for you to stumble so they can go, ah, see Christians stumble. No, they're watching you to say, please, something's got to work. Remember how miserable you were. Remember the burdens you carried. Remember the pain. I do. Without the Lord, man, I was absolutely miserable. No matter how much money, no matter how many women, no matter how much power, misery. Night and day and day and night. And I jammed in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, anything I could to make this pain go away. You know what I mean. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. And Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. 
You know what that's called, guys? Big fancy word, malaise. Malaise. How the fire burned so hot when we first got saved and we couldn't wait to tell everybody about the Lord. And this thing that you read, I remember staying up to one, two in the morning showing my mom, mom, look at this, look at this. And she'd be like, oh, it's great, I'm going to go to bed. I'm not going to move in with you guys. Why? Because all you do is talk about the... And then a few years into it, I just want you to see it today, you know, and I pray for that person. I'm just busy. I'm just busy about work, man. I just got a lot of work right now, you know, just working, just working. You and your wife still, you pray together? Yeah, just, you know, dinner, dinner, prayer, sometimes. It's the Lord, you know, it's the Lord. Let him do what seems good. God's good, you know, all the time. You see it happen? Don't let that happen. Some people ask me, how do you stay so hungry? How do you stay so on fire? Prayer. Prayer lights a fire, man. Prayer is the fire. The more you pray, the more fire you have, man. Prayer, God gives you burden. Prayer, God gives you hunger. Prayer, God gives you desire. Prayer, God gives you desperation. Prayer is the furnace, man. Prayer is the furnace. So I read the Bible. I read this morning. I read. But did you pray? I read. I read the Bible, man. You know, I pray. while I read, I pray. God bless the word. Can't figure out why that. Oh, it's late. Hey, how long are you going to talk? Didn't you say you had something else to say? I got a lot more to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, now that Dan to Beersheba, that's basically saying from, from Florida to California, from Maine to Washington, you know what I mean? It's like saying from one side to the other. From Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Please. Interesting thing happened here. Eli, who was pretty much a godly man for many years ministering in the temple, had Hophni and Phinehas, two of the most wicked sons ever. Now going ahead about 40, 50 years, Samuel had a couple of sons too. And you know what they turned out to be? Dirt bags. So the question is, and the main message of tonight is, why do people who love the Lord have such messed up kids so much? What is it about it? Is it that they spend too much time reading the Bible and not enough time ministering to their kids? I don't, I don't understand. David, a man the Bible says had a heart after God. His kids were horrible, man. The Bible says that a child left... I mean, if you go through the... Uh, the Proverbs, you could hear all the things, a way through it. A child left to himself causes sin and brings, causes shame and brings reproach. You know, don't spare the rod. I, go through the list of things of how you can do all those things. Why do some kids turn out good and some kids don't? What? What is it? You can do everything. Man, let me tell you. You can beat them. You can jam them in the, the word in their brain. You can line their room with the Bible verses. Why do some kids, pastors, what is it? What is it? I have no idea. <laughs> I wish I could tell you what it is. But here's what I can do. I can narrow the field for you. I can narrow it. You ready for me to give you the secret to possible success? Samuel turned out pretty darn good, didn't he? In the Bible here. I mean, here's his kids, three years old, he's serving God. By the time he's 12, he's already doing things. I mean, look how mature he was. He didn't want to tell Eli anything. No, no, I'm going to keep that word. You know, if that was me and I was 12 and God said it to me, I'd be like, Eli, you in trouble, Jack. <laughs> Let's talk about this. <laughs> no, he's like, no, I think we'll just keep that under my head. No, 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 no. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. He tells him. And then it says, this is a mature young man. Which, two things. I mean, let's start from that. Listen, don't ever let them despise your youth. If the Lord is speaking to you, I don't care if you're 9, 10, 11, 12. 
Let the Lord speak to you. This is not like some mutual excuse. The Lord can speak even to, even to young folk. This is proof. I believe this is the word of God. If, if God spoke to Samuel, why cannot he speak to my young son at 15? I know he's been speaking with Arlie. Arlie and uh, her personality just seems to flow with that. The voice of the Lord. Now my other kids are like, why didn't he use me as an example? <laughs> Speaks to Ashlyn a lot. Believe me, Ashlyn probably hears God's voice more than anybody I know, for sure. Elena, she tests things. She's a tester. I'm not going to do nothing until I know it's God. Arlie, why? Oh, was I going to tell you the secret, wasn't I? Well, what did Samuel's mom do different? What? Pray. Pray. You mean you can't force it? You can't finagle it? You can't make it? No, but you can pray it. You can have faith that shows God. Listen, fathers and mothers in here, if you let a day go by, without you praying for your son or daughter, you've already failed miserably. Don't let another day go by without praying for that child. Finding a word, a rhema word, getting it in the Bible. Each one of my kids have Bible verses. Each one of my kids. And God changes them every few years. And I don't know how or how why, but each one of them. And every day I pray for my son Josiah. Every day I pray over him that he would be crucified with Christ, that it no longer be him that lives, but Christ who lives in him, and the life that he lives in the flesh, he would live by faith in the Son of God who loved him and died for him. <coughs> Ashlyn, that she is more than a conqueror through him who loves her. And a few other verses too. Elena and Austin, that they would be of one heart and one mind and one flesh, serving God together all the days of their lives. Who am I forgetting? Arlie. Arlie's got two verses I pray over every day. That she would not grow weary in well-doing, but that she would in due season reap and never lose heart. Cammy Joy. The joy of the Lord would be her strength, and that she would be anointed with the oil of gladness above all her fellows, that the very light of her smile would bring thousands to you before her days are over. Kiki Fay, there's so many verses we prayed over her because of the oppression that we had in adopting and trying to adopt her. But we pray over her, I pray over her that he who is in her would be greater than he was in the wor that he was in this world. And the, what the Lord just showed me about six months ago, I pray over her that his plan is a plan of a future and a hope to prosper her and to give her peace. And for my wife, she also has a verse that should I tell them? That the word says that he who fears the Lord will abide in satisfaction. I pray for satisfaction for my wife every day and that she would never be visited with evil as that word continues to go on and say. And every single day, nary a day goes by that I do not pray these things over them. Why? Because, listen, I could beat them into it. I could submit them into it. I can make them... The only thing that I've ever seen work in Scripture is prayer. Prayer. And when two or more are gathered, if you are a couple and you're not praying together, husband and wife for your children, listen to me. Listen, this is so crazy. What if I told you that you praying for your child every single day will help them never to have to worry about out of, wed out of wedlock pregnancy, uh, drug addiction, I mean, pl uh, prison, jail. What if I told you that? Would you pray for them every single day? Then why are you not? Well, you know, there's a new TV show on and I keep falling asleep while I'm watching it. So, I heard my pastor say this one time and I never forgot it because it so sat with me so well. Why then do all these things if you can do all them and things might turn out bad anyway? 
Why, if you can have kids like Hophni and Phinehas? This man served the Lord all the days of his life. David. I mean, you go through Scripture and talk about all the wastoids that are in the Bible, just absolute wastes of life. Why then? And looking in the church, look at how many pastors, sons, daughters, you know, this one did this, this one's a prostitute. This. I mean, goodness sakes, they're making reality TV shows about it. Why then should you do? If, if you can do everything and they can still turn out bad. My pastor said this, because you're not writing their book, you're writing your book. And your book in their chapter has to say, did all you can do. Amen. Good, Johnny's back there going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm done. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. So much light, so much truth. God, sometimes it's it's hard to swallow that pill without it getting stuck in our throat because there's so much and we fall so short, God, and we're so ashamed of ourselves and feeling so bad about our lives. God, thank you that your word says that you offer us fresh forgiveness every single day. Your mercies are new every day. Thank you that your word says that you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that your word says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God, for that person here that is not feeling convicted but condemned, for that person here that is looking at their life and knowing that for many years they've fallen short, please, God, let their heart know that this is not a call of condemnation, but it's a call of hope, that there is still hope. You're still the God who answers prayers. You're still the God who hears your people and loves your people. Lord, thank you so much for your word, for the life and testimony of, of Samuel. God, may we ring out every little bit and by the power of the blood of our King, every day be praying for our children and our family. Thank you, God. These things we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.